Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order for February 13th, the day before uh, Valentine's Day. If you could um, all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I have an invocation this evening. God, we ask your blessings on those who have been called to lead the community in which we live, play, and work. Guide them peacefully through debate. Remind them that not only are they leaders, but also servants, and that it is their responsibility and ours to serve the common good of all. Grant us the wisdom and courage to know and do what is right, good, and true. May we speak out when it is time to speak out and listen patiently and receptively when it is time to listen. May we always be guided by the spirit of our community, by the spirit of justice, and by the spirit of love in this amazing city of San Marcos. Amen. Okay. Could we please have the roll call? Councilmember Musgrove. Here. Councilmember Nunez. Present. Councilmember Sanella. Deputy Mayor Jenkins. Here. And Mayor Jones. Here. Okay, and if the council could please uh, meet me in the front, we have uh, some football players to uh, recognize. Anyone watch the Super Bowl? We had one of our players uh, actually in it uh, from Mission Hills High School, and tonight we are actually recognizing some of our uh, football players here this evening. Since there are 60 of you, I'm not going to read off everyone's name, but we will have your coach do that. Uh, is Coach Hauser here? Oh, well, there you are. I couldn't see you. All these young men are in front of you. If you could, if you could come on down here, I'm going to read just one, and then I'm going to have you uh, help me get these to everyone. But we are going to have you all come up here, um, and really exciting that we get to recognize you this evening. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you it's so a proud much. moment, right? It's a very proud moment. Yes. Okay, so see let's talk. Me. Let's find out about what these uh, these players did. Uh, so the San Marcos City Council does hereby present you. Coach Hauser, Thank you. Chris Hauser, with an honorable certificate of recognition for an impressive season with Mission Hills High School varsity football team. The coaches and the team have brought considerable recognition to themselves, their school, and their community for their dedication, camaraderie, and sportsmanship, something we really like here. Uh, the City Council of the City of San Marcos proudly congratulates the Mission Hills Grizzlies. Yes. Okay, you guys can like, whoo. Uh, <laughs> On your successful season, but I want the coach to tell us a little bit about what you all did that was so amazing. Well, I, could, I could be up here for a while. Okay, um, well, go, go So I, I know we all minutes. have tight agendas, but just to see these guys uh, be here tonight, uh, Coach Zapata is here with us, our quarterback coach, also our athletic director, also a Mission Hills graduate. Um, coach Zapata played in the very first championship game for Mission Hills back in 2007. He was a quarterback when we played against Oceanside at, uh, when it was still standing Qualcomm Stadium. So um, we've got a, in yeah, so yeah. So we got a, we got a rock star right here, but it begins with these guys here. Um, a year ago, January, it all began in the weight room and we put the work in. We made that commitment to each other to give our best versions of ourselves every day. And they did that. A lot of these guys are playing other sports as well. We got basketball players, track and field, baseball players, wrestlers, soccer players. So they're supporting Mission Hills in more ways than just football. Um, and then we, we do it in May with spring football and they dedicate their summer to us when everybody goes away and does summer vacations. These kids are at Mission Hills every day, lifting and running and competing. And then uh, into July, August rolls around and it's very warm out. We get the gear on and we get ready and we have a very competitive schedule. Uh, this year it changed um, with the Discovery Bowl, which is the ongoing city championship. And we played that mid-season because they're not in our league currently right now. So we did that on a Saturday cross town. And uh, we had a good night over there. 
Um, so we, we got that trophy back at our place and we've had it there for many, many years and we're very proud of that and our hard work that goes into that. And then our tough league uh, um, got us to uh, Division One, and we ended up being the, uh, the top seed, uh, which was a great accomplishment. Um, our first playoff game, once again, was at home against the team from across town. And so again, the student body got revved up for that. And uh, it's always hard to beat somebody twice. And we, and we did that at home. And just to see the joy in their eyes was fantastic. And then we had to host El Camino for the semifinals, who we had beaten just a couple weeks ago, who is a demanding team. And we beat them at home. So that, that kicked us into the championship game against St. Augustine, which it didn't go our way. But it's not because we didn't play our guts out and uh, gave it our all. So it was a heck of a season. One thing we've done, we, we've been around for 20 years now. We're no longer a new school. Um, we've been in the semifinals, which is hard to do, 18 straight years at Mission Hills High School. Wow. Um, so that's a credit to these guys. They have a tar target on their back every year. Everybody wants to beat us. Yeah. And we know that. And we, we welcome that challenge. And we've got a lot of seniors sitting right here who are going to go on and, and represent Mission Hills in many, many ways. Um, to college and, and some are going to play sports as well and, and continue football and do great things. We've got some younger kids here that are doing the same thing right now and getting ready for another season. We host Granite Hills in August, who's going to be a very tough opponent, but we're excited about it. And, and uh, that's Mission Hills Grizzly football in a nutshell. And right. uh, well, thank you guys. Yeah, bring, bring them up. Bring them up. John, bring them up. Come on up. Come on up, guys. Come on up. You sure? Okay, definitely one of the best parts of our job is uh, recognizing folks in our community. I did want to mention that we have uh, interpretation services for anyone that is out in the public. Uh, you could just go back to the uh, speaker slip area and we will get you all the gear if you need that this evening. Um, okay, uh, moving on to our consent calendar. Are there any items that any council members wish to pull for discussion? I'll nope. move to approve. Second. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's? Okay, passes unanimously. Our first oral communications, we have uh, some, oops. Okay, we've got, we've got a few. Um, okay, so our first oral communications uh, are going to be actually, I think it's a group. Okay, I might have gotten these out of order now. All right, I'm just going like this. Okay, um, so our first uh, person is Angela 
Santiago, and I think it's Angelica. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, what does that say? Sorry, it's handwriting. It looks like Angela Santiago. Oh, okay. All right. Um, you will be first, uh, followed by Antonio, Antonia Montoya, and then Irma Raimondo will be after that. Sorry, I forgot to push it. No, you're Pull it good. to yourself. Sorry, I got busy too over there um, helping with the um, translating devices. So first of all, thank you for providing those to our residents. Um, so good evening, um, Mayor and Council Members, Angelica Santiago, and I am here with Universidad Popular. And I am actually here following up from our last um, conversation about the Villa Serena Phase Two residents. So I'm here still uh, advocating for them. Um, so also thank you very much, Phil, for providing the interpretation, very needed. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so hopefully it's very comfortable. I know interpreting is very um, complicated. So um, I just wanna mention that this um, phase has been very, very vi challenging, very um, frustrating. And I think you're gonna hear from our residents. Um, but a highlight, actually we did work with some attorneys from UC San Diego to actually come over last Wednesday to speak to our residents to be able to answer questions you know the answer you know be able to be able to somehow respond to the legal questions so hopefully they will share more about their process um, but thank you for hearing to them thank you thank you very much uh, next up is Antonia Montoya I'm sorry, C can you reach that and just pull that down? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, just pull it all the way down. It won't break. Just all the way down so you can be right. Perfect. Thank you, Phil. Um, yo estoy aquí porque tenemos el problema de que el señor Chris quedó de que nos iba a reubicar. Hasta hoy día no tenemos ninguna respuesta de él. Estamos desesperados todos los vecinos por lo mismo, de que no tenemos una solución en el problema de, los, de la reubicación. Yo fui con él, hablé y le dije mi situación mía, de que yo estoy en esos apartamentos de bajos recursos porque yo soy ya una persona mayor. Entonces, por lo mismo, yo estoy ahí, ¿verdad? So, this is the reason why I'm there. Continue. Entonces… Dice que hay apartamentos. Ya fui, pero donde quiera la lista, list, son de una recámara de 1,500, 1,850. Yo no puedo pagar esa cantidad. Yo en el 2015, que vine aquí a una junta, dijeron que iban a tumbar los apartamentos, pero que nosotros que estábamos viviendo allí, íbamos a tener preferencia para movernos a los otros. Ahora lo que dijeron después que estaban, que hicieron una rifa, Para mí, pienso en mi persona que eso es ilegal. Later on, they said that they would do a raffle, and for me, a raffle would be illegal. Porque no estamos en un casino para estar jugando. Because we're not in a casino to be playing and gambling. Lo que están haciendo, están jugando con nosotros, y eso no está bien, porque si ellos tienen que tener palabra, what they are doing is that they're gambling with our lives. What they really need to have is a you know, word of truth. Como yo, una persona ya mayor. As an elderly lady. Que estoy ya de mi pensión viviendo. That I'm living with my pension. Yo no puedo ir a pagar un, un, una cantidad, como él dijo, aquí está la lista, pero 
¿Qué nos ganamos con ir con la lista si no hay apartamentos? I cannot pay the amount that is presented on the list. And what good does it do me when there's not really even any apartments to, you know, to choose? Yo quiero que él, por escrito, nos dé una solución, pero por escrito. Yo no quiero de palabras. I would like to have him do, um, you know, write to us and have a solution that is written to us, not out just out of the mouth. Porque no nomás soy yo. Somos muchos los que estamos en este problema. Because it's not only me. There's a lot of us that are in the same problem. Y cuando ellos dijeron que iban a movernos a los otros apartamentos, eso es lo que yo estoy molesta porque no tienen palabra, porque metieron gente de otros lados, de San Diego, de Lemon Grove, del de Cajón, pero nosotros que estamos ya con tantos años viviendo aquí, nos dejaron abanicando afuera. When they told us about this and moving us to another unit, uh, we were told that we would be, you know, the, the choice people, but what they did is that they picked up a lot of people from El Cajón, uh, Lemon Grove and other areas, and those are the people that got the apartments, and then we were left lying. Porque ahí hay personas que están pagando hasta 250. There's people that are there paying 250. Y porque son personas que trajeron de otros lados, por amistad de la manager. And why are they there? Are they friends to the manager? Yo ya fui y hablé con Chris y le dije, eso que están haciendo ustedes no es justo lo que nos están haciendo a nosotros. I went and spoke with Chris and I said that that was not fair. Well, what is being done for us is just not fair. Yo quiero que por escrito nos den la solución que vamos a hacer, porque ellos tienen que cumplir con su palabra de que nos iban a relocar. I would like to have a written solution because I, they should stand on the word of what they said that they would be helping us relocate. En la junta que tuvimos, a toda la gente nos ofrecieron cinco mil. A ver que él se vaya con cinco mil a agarrar un apartamento, no puede uno porque le, pa, le cobran lo mismo de renta, lo mismo de depósito y no alcanza con cinco mil. Yo tengo amistades que estaban antes y les dieron mucho más dinero por el tiempo que vivieron. In the last meeting, uh, you know, they told us, uh, they talked to us and they gave us a 5,000, would give us $5,000. $5,000, what is that good for? When all the rents and everything, wherever we go, is going to be as high. So there's going to be a solution. Ya se acabó el tiempo. Okay. Muchas gracias y quiero Thank que, you. por favor, ustedes que están aquí representando, Hagan algo por nosotros. And please do something for us as representatives of your people. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question of staff, and that is, I believe that National Corps has had some meetings. Um, have we been present at any of those meetings? Yes, Sylvia Daniels has been present at some of the, the larger meetings and has been following up. Okay, um, could we make sure we follow up with um, Antonia? Um, I, I, I'm going to put a note on her um, speaker slip. Absolutely. Um, and then we can make sure that we contact her. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Irma Raimondo. Oh, I did want to mention something too for all of the um, folks. I might need a translation on this. Um, that after our last meeting, uh, when we had the volunteer. Um, uh, interpreter, we actually sent our interpreter gift cards in the same amount that we are paying for the services at market rate, if, if anyone wanted to um, know that we had done that. Sí, buenas tardes a todos y muchísimas gracias por escucharnos. La verdad que estamos... Uno moment. Oh, no, no, okay. no, Okay. Can you... Good afternoon. There is and then an, appear, an appropriate period to translate and then additional comments so that you're not talking over one another? I was just going to say a hand, hand mic, that would be great. Yeah. And for clarification too, since, since it takes twice as long for the interpretation, I think the timing needs to be adjusted accordingly. I think it can be accommodated. I don't know that it nece necessarily needs to be twice, but it should, it, it, it should accommodate additional time for the translation services, yes. <coughs> Okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Bien, de favor. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, la razón que estamos aquí de vuelta otra vez. Por el, the reason why we're back here with you. Por la misma situación. Thank you. De que estamos esperando alguna respuesta. Is because of the same issue because we're still waiting for an answer. Porque como dijo el señor Chris, que no, bueno, que nosotros tratemos también de nuestra parte. Because as Mr. Chris said that we should, you know, do our, your, our part as well. Buscar apartamento. Yo de mi parte, tomé un día de mi trabajo para ir a buscar apartamento. That we should look for apartments and I did take off one day of work to try to look for an apartment. Y la verdad que no, de bajo recurso no hay. Está cerrada la lista. And the lists are closed for um, low cost living. Fui en algunos de renta regular, son de dos mil para arriba. I went to regular rentals and they're two thousand and above. Y lo que yo gano es muy poco. And what I make is very little. Es muy poquito lo que yo gano porque yo solita trabajo. Tengo dos niños que mantener. Tengo más gastos. I'm a single mother. I have two children and I have more expenses. Ahora lo que estoy pidiendo y creo que todos los residentes de ahí queremos que nos dé una hoja escrita. Now what we're requesting, and it's not only me, but all of us that live there, is that we have a written letter. Porque las palabras se lo lleva el viento. Y lo que queremos es de algo escrito de que estamos respaldados de que nos reubiquen. Because the wind takes your words away and what we're waiting is for somebody to support us in a way that we can move. Ahorita ya estamos ya casi finalizando este mes. Ya falta poco para la fecha que nos dieron. It's almost the end of the month and we don't have time. It's running out. Y es estresante de estar pensando solamente de que en cualquier momento nos digan que ya tenemos que salirnos y no tenemos donde irnos. It's very stressful to go day by day thinking that someday we're going to be pushed out and we don't have a place to go. Entonces lo que yo exijo de que me dé una carta escrita de que sí me van a reubicar. So what I am requesting is a written letter that I will be, you know, placed again somewhere. Eso es lo único que yo les pido. That's the only thing I'm asking. Que ustedes también nos escuchen y nos apoyen. That you listen to us and that you support us. Así como cada uno de ustedes tiene sus hijos. Just like each one of you has children. Póngase a pensar en mi lugar. Please put yourself in my shoes. Que soy madre soltera y no me alcanza. Por esa razón estoy viviendo en ese lugar. I'm a single mom and I don't have no, I don't make enough money. That's why I live where I live. Y como le dije al señor Chris, o pago renta y no come mis hijos. As I told Mr. Chris, either I pay my rent or my children don't eat. Entonces, eso es lo que estoy exigiendo, que me dé una hoja escrita para que en cualquier momento no llegue y me digan que me tengo que ir. So that is exactly what I am demanding, a letter, written letter, so that the time doesn't come when all of a sudden I'm get, you know, get kicked out. Porque yo ya traté de buscar, pero no hay de bajo recurso. Because I have tried, but I can't find anything low income. Definitivamente renta regular no puedo pagar. Definitely a regular rent is impossible. I cannot pay it. Por esa razón estamos de vuelta suplicándoles que nos escuchen. That is why we are back and we are begging that you listen to us. Eso es todo lo que les quería pedir. That's all I wanted to ask you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to make one comment and that so maybe translate. Um, Quiero hacer un comentario. The city is not in charge of the process. The process is between National Corps and, and the residents. So we're, we don't, we're not involved in that process to the point where we would write a letter um, because we're, we're not involved in that process. La ciudad desafortunadamente no está involucrada en ese proceso. 
Entonces, aunque nos pidan a nosotros una carta, no podemos hacerlo. Está en ese proceso otra compañía que hace esos asuntos. And we will definitely be reaching out to National Corps and talking to them and doing everything we can on our end. Esa compañía se llama National Corps y lo que vamos a hacer es tratar de localizarlos y tener contacto con ellos para poder hacer nuestra parte lo mejor posible. But again, we're not in charge of the process. Pero una vez más, les digo que no estamos encargados de ese proceso. And then I have a question of staff, which you may want to also uh, translate. Okay. Y tengo una pregunta, pero también se va a interpretar. Do we know how many families are still um, waiting to find suitable housing? And by, the, cuantas, oh, and by the way, it's May 1st, right? As of May 1st? Yes. Um, Sylvia is re okay. receiving updates on how many families have been placed. She's been in contact with all of our affordable housing partners. She is encouraging and facilitating that. Um, so I would need to get back to, to council with the, the updated yeah. list of people still looking for okay, housing. So go Do we have a status as to what, uh, well, because we had talked about this at the last meeting. Do we have a status as to what's available? Do we have like an inventory of that yet? Um, I believe, uh, Sylvia is not here this evening, so I, I think before I commit on the record, I, I wanna just verify with Sylvia, but she has been working on that and she has directly been engaging with Ginger and a lot of the other uh, developing, the developments around us that might accommodate some of our folks. Okay, so our next council meeting is in two weeks. Would it be fair to ask that we would have an update and an inventory provided prior to our next council meeting? Yes. I certainly just don't wanna have this happen again where we, we don't know what's going on. Um, and this is not an agendized item, so we're really not, we're very limited in our discussion about it. I know, I know, um, Madam Counselor. Um, I just, I just am asking some questions um, as to what we can actually get before our next meeting. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is going to be uh, Alicia, uh, followed by, Ali oh. I do, I do. I don't know up. if there are two uh, Alicias. I, I okay, realize let's, that. Let's be very careful though, Council Member, being that's yeah, not an agenda. I do item. have a point of clarification though to follow up on the question because I think there was a misinterpretation yeah, okay. Um, as the speaker, Antonia, mentioned that there was a lottery that happened, mm -hmm. and the interpreter interpreted mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there was supposed to be some sort of lottery, mm -hmm. but the speaker mentioned that a lottery happened, and so I would like for us to get brief specifically on that lottery if it did happen. No, no, es que tiene que meter la oreja de aquí arriba, la parte de arriba, como ganchito. No I'm not sure if you're asking staff to include uh, that in the briefing or you're asking the, uh, the speaker to clarify. Uh, no, um, you're reopening that public comment I for understood the speaker, but there was a misinterpretation of what was said. So I'm asking for staff to, to inquire and brief us on that. No, so yes, okay. we'll do. Thank you. Yeah. Bueno, yo soy la señora Alicia Reyes. Tenemos ocho años viviendo en los apartamentos, yo y mi hijo. I am Alicia yeah. Reyes. I'm mm -hmm. one of the residents. My son and I live in the apartments. Ajá. Y cuando tuvimos una cita, nos dieron una hoja para que fuéramos a buscar apartamentos y no encontramos de bajos recursos. Dicen que están llenos y que no, no tienen. Y hasta problemas tuvimos en los apartamentos. And when they gave us that piece of paper, we went out and tried to look for something to, that we could move to, that it was a low income and there's nothing available. And we even had mm -hmm. severe problems within the apartments where we live. Yo y mi hijo nos fuimos a buscar apartamento porque vivimos los dos en el apartamento. Él no trabaja porque está enfermito, yo también. Me caí de mi trabajo y pues vivimos solamente con lo del seguro y no nos alcanza mucho para pagar un apartamento normal. Neither my son nor I right now are working. My son is special needs and I got injured in my job. So we're living just with the insurance money which is not enough to live and to rent any apartment. Quisiera que esta persona se pensara que pues uno no tiene mucho edad para estar pagando tanto dinero en apartamentos normales. 
-hmm. I would like for that person to think about, you know, that we don't have enough money to get into a normal apartment. Y pues ellos, ellos sí nos pueden dejar más tiempo allí para nosotros poder estar buscando apartamentos porque pues es muy poco tiempo lo que nos dieron y creo que en este tiempo no podemos agarrar nada porque siempre vamos y no nos encontramos. Also, there should be some kind of consideration that maybe we can possibly stay there longer um, since there was not enough time given to us to just all of a sudden depart. And if that could be extended, that would be really good for all of us. Espero que nos ayuden a todos los que vivimos en este apartamento, porque estamos frustrados todos. I hope that you help us out, because we're so frustrated in all these apartment issues that we're having. Um, bueno, esperemos su ayuda, porque sí la necesitamos mucho, y pues, Siempre andamos buscando apartamentos y vamos a lugares y siempre no encontramos. We are hopeful that you are able to help us uh, because we are trying to find a place to live, but it's been impossible to find something. A veces yo me siento frustrada, también mi hijo se siente frustrado por lo que no encontramos para dónde ir a, a vivir. Sometimes my son, as well as I, feel very frustrated because we don't know and we can't find anywhere to live. Y es, pues, esperemos que nos ayuden. So I'm hopeful that you will help us. Eso es todo. Okay, es todo. And that's it. Y, pues, gracias. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Okay. 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 Um, I did have one other question. I think this is okay. Whenever there is a process or whenever there is an affordable housing development um, that there are discussions ongoing, are there other resources that are actually connected to, like um, um, Section 8, all those sorts of things um, of, of help rental assistance uh, that is available for folks? I'm just curious. Yes, my understanding is that um, staff tries to work with the developer. The developer is the, the one responsible for assisting and connecting the residents, which okay. I think their relocation relocation specialist is that's part of their their job. Um, and there is a lottery that is going to take place. Sylvia's going to get back to us on the date, and um, I did forward to the council. A, the information on Via Serena that went out on Friday, so okay. that you have that now, and then we'll update you prior to the next council meeting. Okay, great. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I have another speaker slip with an Alicia. I don't know if it's, okay. Another Alicia, a different Alicia? Okay. I think there's a second to Alicia, yes. It just says Alicia, no last name, thank you. ¿Quién tengo el visto? Yo soy Ana Elvia Sánchez, su intérprete, y el consejo está listo para hablar con usted. Aquí está el tiempo que le dan para hablar. Ok, muchas gracias. Okay. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> gracias. Thank you. Este, señoras y señores, mi nombre es Alicia Romero. Ya tuve el gusto de conocerlos. <laughs> um, Yo quería enseñarle, yo quería pedirles autorización a ustedes si yo puedo hablar de discriminación y puedo hablar de daños y perjuicios y puedo hablar de preocupación. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've had the pleasure to um, have met you before, but today I come with a different issue and I'm asking you permission if I could actually speak about discrimination damages and worries you 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 have 5 minutes you can speak about whatever you'd like tiene 5 minutos puede hablar de lo que usted guste 5 minutos mhm aquí está su reloj está um alguien del national core está aquí is there anyone here from national core i i 
I doubt it because it's not on the agenda. There's no agenda. There's no um, nothing on our agenda is about this this evening. This is oral communications. Lo dudo porque ustedes ahorita están nada más hablando como comunicación oral. Oh. Eso no estuvo puesto en la orden del día. Oh, okay. Did someone tell you that it was going to be on the agenda this evening? Uh, Alguien le dijo a usted que iba a estar su, su tema en esta agenda o en esta orden no. del día? Oh, okay. 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 I was no, just curious. No, okay. Bueno, pues no voy a hablar mucho, ¿verdad? Porque tengo cinco minutos. Pero pues aquí, ¿verdad? Eh, estoy, eh, vine, pues para decir un poquito de, de que hay mucha, hay de, de que hemos pasado discriminación. So I'm here with not a lot of time in my hand to speak with you, but I do want to say that uh, I believe there's quite a bit of discrimination. Daños y perjuicios. Uh, damages. Daños y perjuicios y tenemos muchas preocupaciones. Prejudice and as well, we have a lot of worries. Ya que hay, ya que hay personas discapacitadas, hay personas, hay senior que necesitan, necesitan reubicación. Because not only are we normal people, we also have people with disabilities, we have seniors, and we all need to be relocated. Um, eh, los apartamentos, eh, pues, damos gracias que tenemos en donde vivir y no estamos en la calle. Pero hemos pasado, uh, los apartamentos no están muy bien no está muy bien este este eh, no estamos muy bien porque hay muchos insectos we are very grateful that we're not out in the streets but at the same time the apartments is, are not in good condition they're filled with bugs and insects que no se puede ni cocinar you can't even cook um, Nosotros esperamos, ahorita no vino ningún representante, me parece, de National Corp, pero nosotros este, necesitamos este, un papel este, firmado por él para que nos, nos, nos pueda reubicar, ¿sí? nos pueda dar alojamiento, porque este, uh, pues, nos ha dicho y nos ha prometido en todas las juntas que hemos tenido con él. So what we need is actually a written document uh, where all the promises are, you know, in a written manner because we need relocation. We need um, to be placed in, in, in a place, you know, with a secure date. Y pues somos las mismas personas que yo he mirado que estamos ahí. No, no sé si ya haya reubicado a alguien. No, no estoy segura, pero Estamos ahí como, pues, todas estas personas que están aquí. I continue to see the same people. I don't know if they have, you know, if they've relocated anybody. Some of the people that we're talking about are actually present here, as you know. Entonces, pues, esperamos que él, 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 este, pues, que no nos deje ahí porque pues ya están poniendo las flechas donde van a derrumbar el, la propiedad. I hope that he doesn't just leave us hanging because they're putting all the markings already for where they're going to be destroying the property. Y todos los que estamos aquí, estamos ahí. Estamos en, en, en esa propiedad de Villa Sirena. And all of us that are here present, we are there in Villa Sirena. Entonces, este... Uh, también les iba a decir de, eh, digo también este eh, hubo mucho mucho este cuando se derrumbó el 340 cuando se estaba en construcción y todo hubo muchos muchos car muchos tickets que aún no sea no no por lo menos yo no he pagado o sea 
he pagado, eh, todavía debo ticket que pagar. So when uh, 340 crumbled or got destroyed, there were a lot of tickets, and there's a lot of tickets that are still need to be paid. I, you know, I haven't paid my ticket either. ¿Por qué? Porque eh, los carros eh, sobre, sobre eh, la avenida de Villa Sirena, que eh, somos residentes de ahí, eh, eh, hubo muchos choques, hubo muchos tickets. Because there were a lot of um, cars that had um, tickets, and because there were a lot of accidents there on Villa Sirena, where we live. Ahí alrededor de los negocios que están ahí a un ladito de, 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 lo, de los apartamentos Villa Sirenas, ahí fue donde, donde este, hubo muchos tickets. The surrounding businesses had a lot of tickets as well in Villa Sirena. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, Marla Mendoza, followed by Cesar Salgado. Maria Mendoza? It's Maria Mendoza. Maria Mendoza. Oh, actually, I guess if I put my glasses on, I would be able to tell that. Ah, <laughs> uh, muy buenas Sorry. noches. Mi nombre es María Mendoza. Good evening. My name is María Mendoza. Uh, la razón por la que me encuentro aquí es porque uh, necesito pedirles que uh, nos den una constancia de que nos van a reubicar porque hace dos semanas a National Corps. Um, I'm here because I feel that we need you so that we have some kind of a proof of relocation because last week, two weeks ago, um, National Los, uh, Villa Serena, Villa Serena mm -hmm. este, nos hicieron una junta diciéndonos que nos iban a ayudar a reubicarnos, que si desafortunadamente no encontrábamos a dónde ir a vivir, ellos nos iban a pagar el hotel, que nosotros íbamos a pagar renta. So they said that, you know, they would help us relocate, if we, but they would say that if we didn't find a place to live on our own, they will put us in a hotel and play, pay some rent. Y, y nos, nosotros íbamos a pagar la renta que pagamos y ellos iban a pagar la diferencia. So we were going to pay the rent, but they were going to pay the difference. Pero... Yo ya en lo personal no le creo a ellos porque a mí me prometieron que me iban a reubicar en la uni en el edificio que se acaba de construir. So I don't believe any word that they say because they told me that they would relocate me in the building, the new building. Y mi error fue haber creído en sus palabras. My mistake was believing them. Y no haber pedido un papel que dijera que me iban a, a reubicar en ese Edificio. And not asking for any docum documentation for to be relocated in that other building. Entonces, para mí sus palabras ya han perdido validez y yo necesito algo que que me valide que sí me van a a cumplir lo que no nos están diciendo que se va a llevar a cabo. So there's no truth in their word, and I need for something to prove that they are going to do what they told us they would do. Ah. Uh, yo he estado buscando uh, apartamentos y supuestamente ustedes iban a llamar para que de, hicieran a un lado su lista de espera y a los que estamos en el Villa Serena fuéramos prioridad. I, um, a ver. I, 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 we've been waiting at Villa Serena because we were told that you were going to take care of it and we're still waiting. Pero yo cu cuando voy, este, por, eh, el día de ayer fui a aplicar a uh, The Canals Apartment. But yesterday I went to um, try to apply at the Knowles Apartments. Y me dijeron que ya, ya habían recibido una llamada diciendo que nos dieran prioridad, pero quedaron de mandar una lista con todos los residentes 
para que es, se va, llevara a cabo esa lista, pero no han recibido esa lista. I was told that they were told that they would receive a list with the names of the uh, dwellers, and they told me yesterday that they haven't received anything. Yo llevé la hoja que me mandó la ciudad y la, y la notificación de Villa Serena, y me dijeron que yo era la, la segunda persona que había llevado esas dos hojas, pero que la, desafortunadamente la gente se está aprovechando de esa oportunidad y está yendo de otros lados mintiendo, diciendo que van de Villa Serena. So what has happened is that um, there's only been two people that have brought the papers from the city and the letter from Villa Serena, which was, I was one of them, and then another person. But they told me also that other people have found out about this and that they're taking advantage of it and getting into the, into the building. Entonces, en, en estos apartamentos no pueden hacer nada hasta que reciban la lista de los residentes que de verdad van a ser reubicados. So nothing, nothing can be done at the Knowles uh, unless they have the list so that they can, you know, put us, bring us into the property. Y no, no solamente, este, si nos están ayudando en buscar, pero no nada más, eh, no, en el momento que vamos a aplicar nos están pidiendo muchos requisitos y uno de ellos son talones de cheques de tres meses y desafortunadamente yo no los tengo. ¿Y cómo es que yo le voy a hacer para aplicar en un apartamento? So one of the things that's happening also when, uh, because they're supposedly helping us to find apartments, is that the places that they look for um, require a lot of paperwork and items like three months of stubs and, you know, like I don't have pay stubs from, from three months behind, so how are we ever going to get anything? No me quieren valer que mis ingresos empezaron a partir de, de enero. Ellos forzosamente quieren talones de cheques de tres meses, entonces, me siento frustrada porque se supone que ya tenían una unidad para mí disponible, pero por ese requisito no me pudieron dar esa unidad. My income started in January, so they are not accepting it because they went three months behind. And supposedly they already had a unit for me, but now they're denying it because I don't have the three months with the stubs. Es todo, gracias. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Gracias. Um, the next speaker is going to be Cesar, followed by Arthur Wang. So, um, we do we do usually only have 15 minutes of I, actually I, I, yeah I think it's 15 minutes of speakers. There are quite a few more speakers here. I think I'm just going to go through all of them. If you could just let everyone know so that we can get them home to their families, being that this is taking a while. Como esto está pasando, tomando mucho tiempo, entonces este, y na, se, nada más se nos da 15 minutos para opiniones públicas. Vamos a dejar las cosas así y vamos a tomar en cuenta a todas las personas que necesitan hablar porque son conocidos. Ok, so Cesar, Salgaro, Zagaldo. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es César Salgado. Good afternoon, my name is César Salgado. Voy a ser breve en lo que tengo que hablar. I'm going to speak a little bit short. En lo personal, Chris sí contesta las llamadas, ha respondido, sí está haciendo su parte. And personally, I believe that Chris is doing his part. He is, has responded to the phone calls. El miércoles 31 de enero tuvimos otra reunión todos los inquilinos de Villa Serena con el equipo de Chris. Uh, on Wednesday, the 31st of January, we got together with his team. Él prometió que sí nos iban a reubicar y que las personas que no pudieran reubicar las iba a meter en un hotel hasta que les encontrara algo. And he said that he would relocate us and for those that were not able to relocate that they would put them in the hotel and help us through. Lo único que nosotros pedimos, no sé si nos puedan ayudar ustedes para que ellos nos puedan dar algo escrito de que eso nos, nos garantice algo. The only thing that we are inquiring from you is that we have some kind of a written something so that we have kind of a guarantee that they will continue to help us and relocate us. Y también quería ver si es posible, si ustedes pueden mandar a otra persona aparte de Silvia para que apoye a ellos a que los ayude con la reubicación. 
and maybe <coughs> you can send somebody else besides Sylvia so that they, she can help or they can help them uh, with the relocation. Es todo lo que, ten, todo lo que tengo que decir. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, again, we, we're not in charge of the process. It's between the residents and National Corps. We're just assisting to make sure the process go, you know, to do our best to help with the process. But we are not in charge of the process or we're not, we're not a party of the actual agreements, Entonces, if that makes sense. Les repetimos, no estamos involucrados ni podemos estar involucrados como ciudad. Es CORE el que tiene que hacer este proceso directamente con ustedes. Ok. Ok. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ok, we have uh, one more speaker, um, Flower Alvarez López. Yeah, I just turned in the slip. I figured that I would be the last speaker, not the. the sorry, that they they just put it down, and and there was another speaker that left. So sorry. No worries. Um, my name is Flower Alvarez Lopez. Um, I'm one of the co-directors at Universidad Popular here in, in San Marcos. I'm a San Marcos native. Been here my whole life. Um, I went to Woodland Park when it was an elementary school. I went to Woodland Park when it was a middle school, and I went to San Marcos High School. Um, I'm here to um, speak really about what the residents of Via Serena are, are facing and kind of um, my role in this. We've been supporting some of the residents. Um, I've been able to attend some of the resident meetings and um, just want to uplift their concerns. I want to make sure that the city council is really um, taking their situation to heart. I want to thank all of you all for um, the support that you have provided and um, are willing to kind of make sure that National Corps lives up to, to the end of the deal. Um, just wanted to voice that. Um, thank you all for, for listening to the residents today and hopefully um, we see San Marcos um, uplift the families and um, that we make sure that everybody gets relocated and um, what they deserve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up is Maureen, Marlene Walder. Followed by John Mosier. Uh, I'm Marlene Walder from San Marcos Mobile Estates. Uh, we have had a change of management. We have no management right now. But uh, everyone got fired and they have come up with uh, saying nothing about all the activities that they had canceled right before. But the pool and the jacuzzi, this has been a year has not worked on and off, and now they spent all this money for a jacuzzi that the uh, water that comes in isn't always coming in with pressure. Uh, the pool has lost, and I think they just got it back again this week, the heater, but it's a continuous battle. People have said more than once, and they think I'm in charge uh, somehow, but they have said that uh, the pool was why they moved there. They do not understand why the rent goes up so much because when they moved in, it was at 2%, and we're coming up for our rent review again. And I'm hoping we're going to settle with the new people who are going to be running it. Uh, they have problems with electricity, problems with the road. And I went again and put in a notice about the windows that are on that wall out there. And I even spoke to the lawyer and she said, no, there's no record. And she said, here, I'll fill out the form for you. And she filled it out and that was three weeks ago or almost now, or well, I didn't come last time, so it's four weeks. 
um, at, that the new management came about, or three weeks, I guess. The new management came about at, right at the time the lady from the housing department called me. And so my real concern is that we hopefully will get the amenities that have been promised and that uh, we'll be able to get the rent down with um, negotiations with the new management uh, so we don't have to come and visit you with the owners. But they're not willing to share so far anything except they bought a brand new truck, uh, a big one, and it's been sitting blocking the parking lot space since that day also that the housing committee has called, which is very interesting because that's part of their expenses that they had to have a brand new truck. Okay, thank you. That was it. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, followed, uh, or next up is John Mosier, and then it will be concerned citizen neighbor number one. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Thank you for your time. Um, a few clarifications. Uh, that pickup truck sitting there is from Nevada where the owners live. So all our money is not staying here in the city. That's what you hear from us is absentee owners. Um, it has been there for about a month. It's something that, that was in their notes from the rent review hearing. It was one of their little items that several years ago that said they wanted to spend money on. Um, we had asked them to spend some money and get us back to a shuttle like they used to have to, to help our people get somewhere. Um, we have a meeting this Saturday about this 5.2% rent increase at our clubhouse at one o'clock in the afternoon. I know it's short notice, but if anybody actually had time to stop by and hear from some of our seniors who are severely affected by these continual increases, um, I keep looking at ways that we can solve controlling these increases, um, no matter what the CPI is and make sure our seniors on fixed incomes and social security um, have a secure future. I got a call from one of our people asking me, didn't, didn't the ordinance protect us so that we couldn't get an increase higher than what our social security was? I explained to them what our ordinance was and just the change in CPI. Um, I bring that up because um, I would like to find out how we actually get something like that as an agendized item where we can have people come here and talk about what's affecting them and then we can also tear apart the CPI so you can actually see how I'm viewing it as to what a development is, what's involved in it, and, and why other cities, some have actually locked in at 3%, some have locked in at half of CPI, our sister cities are 75%, and actually look at what we could do to help the seniors going forward. Um, it, I, it looks like we've got a few more years of high amounts of increases coming at us. Uh, at, at the same time, I'm, I'm trying to look at how I can help our seniors, not just in the city as I've talked before, but um, county, state. Um, Tim Sheehan is good because he has, he has um, experience even nationwide. Um, Sylvia and Tess met with Tim and I last month to go over some of these issues affecting our mobile home residents, our senior residents. Um, today at the Jim, when, when Jim Desmond um, spoke to us this morning and Sharon and Mike were there, um, I brought it up to, to try and find out more help from more people where we could reach out. And um, Adrian, um, Jim's community relations outreach person, spent some time with me. And she has volunteered to be included, like with, with the Sylvia and Tess, Tim, myself, anybody else from the city, that they can help find us resources, because that's where we're at now, is we're all trying to find resources to help figure a way forward with everybody. Um, uh, I also talked with Mark Schaefer from Brian Jones, um, Senator Brian Jones' office, to, to see where they can help us. Um, so we're working at that. And um, last time I was here, I talked about um, the help I was trying to get with, uh, say, EDCO or the trash 
how we if we get a large dumpster roll off or what we do to help people with where they're trying to get us to now um, recycle our food waste and scraps. And I was lucky this morning I met Jim Ambrosa, their general manager, and talked to him for a while. Um, so he's given me some ideas. So I'll be working with them and I'll be working, getting back with Sylvia and Tess to see what happens from that point. But anyway, I, I'd appreciate if we could go forward and somehow get this where we actually have a meeting where we actually talk about it and get input from uh, more sides. I think it might help us solve something and actually set, set an example for other cities, um, not just here, but in our county. I know uh, some of the cities without uh, protection like us are hurting. Um, I heard one example in Valley Center today. I know I've heard of uh, um, and Lakeside also. Anyway, thank you guys for your time. Thank you, John. And uh, just as a reminder, we are very limited in what we can do as far as the ordinance because it was voted in by the residents right. of uh, the city. So, I, I understand. But yeah. I'm sure I can get enough residents be willing to sign a petition, whatever we need, to make the ad adjustments. And I know you guys can make some adjustments, but it would be nice to get together and actually discuss it from both sides and, and look at it even from the owner's side um, to figure out what to do. Thank you, John. You got Appreciate it. it. Okay, um, next up is going to be concern neighbor one, followed by concern neighbor two, and then, of course, on from there. Thank you, perfect. Okay, so uh, I kind of wanted to start with an overview. This is our neighborhood. Um, and you could see our neighborhood, we're on Elizabeth Street. It's Madam, white. can you please speak into the microphone? Oh. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so our neighborhood, um, we live on Elizabeth Street, and you could see from this map that it's right in the middle of four um, different schools. We have Richland Elementary, Woodland Park Middle, Mission Hills High School, and then Mission Hills Church has a preschool there. Um, so slide two, please. This is going like, um, it's our neighborhood again. And you could see our street. There's actually 26 homes on our street. 10 of those homes have children under the age of 11. Um, and of those 10 homes, there's a total of 18 kids under the age of 11 that live there. Uh, five additional households. They have young ch grandchildren that either live there or visit often. And we do have one licensed daycare on that street. Um, we are less than a mile from Richland Elementary. We're less than a mile from Woodland Park Middle, from Mission Hills High. Um, we're only 0.4 miles from Hollandia Park, Woodland Park, Mulberry Park. That's our neighborhood, that's our community. Um, slide um, two, yeah, perfect. You could leave it on slide two, please, sorry. Um, so I wanted to give background as to where we are. Um, but I, myself, I've lived in my home for 14 years and we moved there. Um, it was a beautiful neighborhood, it still is. Um, very lively, love my neighbors, most of them. Um, when we moved there, 647 was the nicest looking house on the block. Um, it was already becoming a bit of a problem, but nothing major, no real concerns. Um, at the time, the owner would get to drinking, she'd pick fights with her tenants, she'd then call the police. It's how she kind of got like her entertainment. Um, as she got older though, the drinking subsided and we were able to peacefully coexist for a number of years. My husband and I started our family. Um, we really settled in, got to know our um, neighbors. During COVID, the owner's son and girlfriend moved in and they started living in the garage, not the house, the garage. Um, soon after, they had their friends flopping at that house. There were people living in cars in the driveway, parked on the street. They were running extension cords from the house into the vehicles to charge their devices, running heaters. Then the drug dealing started. At first, the son and girlfriend were selling drugs from the garage and stashing them in bushes. Slide three, please. Here's a few of our little buyers looking for the drugs in the bushes. Um, and this is on a direct walking path to both Woodland um, Park Middle and to Richland Elementary School. And there have been children, I stand out there in the morning, who are walking by as people are looking for drugs in the bushes. Um, once um, they caught on that we are watching them selling the drugs from their garage and the bushes, they moved to a cul-de-sac that's adjacent to their home. They caught on to that too, that we were documenting their drug sales I'd stand out there and wave at all the people coming to buy. Um, so they started making deliveries on their scooter. And electric scooters are not quiet. 
so you know exactly what they're up to. They would ride them to a transformer box on Richland Road. That transformer box is on the walking path to Richland Elementary. They began using a drone that they fly over our neighborhood. They use it to check for the police. They use it to check for the neighbors because they know we document. When they knew we were watching there as well, they moved into the local parks. I've been at the park with my children and I see them riding their scooters through Woodland Park. I witnessed a drug deal in Hollandia Park selling to an older man in a black Mercedes. It has become apparent that the illicit happenings being witnessed at 647 Elizabeth Street are not isolated incidents, but rather a pattern of illegal activity. The members of 647 are increasingly having a direct impact on the safety of everyone in our neighborhood, especially our children. Slide four, please. In March 2023, Finding a man passed out on the sidewalk directly in front of 647 while children were actively walking to school changed the trajectory of how our neighborhood began to react to each new incident. We decided to no longer be passively annoyed or angry with the members of 647. Collectively, we made the decision to rise up as a community and take action. Slide five, please. We began meeting from planning sessions where we organized our ideas. We leaned on the skill sets honed in each of our professions. We pooled financial resources, we coordinated safer playdates after school, and we began working together to monitor the members of 647 Elizabeth. Slide six, please. Security cameras were installed, and we started a conscious effort to decrease the revenue 647 brought in with drug sales. We made efforts to increase the city's involvement via phone calls and utilizing the city portal. We worked with code enforcement to get the son and girlfriend removed from the garage. It yielded a healthier and safer environment for the owner. To date, the following city entities have been contacted for help by members of our neighborhood. The sheriff, both patrol and narcotics. Crime prevention through environmental design. Fabulous, by the way, if you have not used that. Code enforcement, adult protective services, elderly law and advocacy, animal control, city hall, public records, and now you, our city council members. Slide seven, please. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Can the next person pick up where you left off because everyone gets five minutes, which is more than most cities actually give you to speak? That's okay. Uh, yeah, thank um, you. No, they um, cannot, but um, that's okay. I think sorry. the photos speak for themselves. Sorry, thank you. Okay, concerned uh, resident number yes, two. I have concerned resident number two. Uh, we're going by these names tonight, by the way, because there has been re uh, threats of retaliation from the people in that house. I live on Elizabeth Street. Uh, I bought there almost nine years ago. And like my neighbor was saying, a couple years ago, um, the owner's son moved in and started dealing drugs. I live closer to one of the main roads um, I have found drugs in my backyard that have been thrown over the fence. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. Um, so I found some, a bag of drugs that was thrown over the fence probably when the police were driving by and they almost got busted. So that's been fun. Um, people will sit in front of my house while my kids are, they want to go outside in the front and play, but I won't allow them these days. When I first moved in, it was great. All the kids were on the street. They play together. This whole street of neighbors is a village. We watch each other's kids. We take care of each other's kids. They play when they can. And in the last couple of years, the street is desolate. Uh, because of this house, every kid on the street knows to stay away from this house. I've had people knock on my door asking for the weirdest things, um, just not knowing what house they're supposed to go to to buy their drugs and end up at the wrong house. Uh, as has been mentioned more recently, drones have flown over the houses, and since my house is close to the main road where the police would be driving or the buyers would be coming into driving, it hovers over my backyard for a good 10, 15 minutes uh, as my kids are in the spa in the backyard, which is very concerning because they also have a registered sex offender in the house. And so we don't know who's also looking at the footage of the drones. Um, 
So we skipped that house on Halloween for numerous reasons, even though they are handing out candy, which is wonderful. Um, as has been said, drugs have been found in the bushes. I've snapped photos of unconscious people on the street and warned my children not to go near them if they see them. Police come sometimes, quite often, in fact, but this has been years and years and years, and nothing seems to be fixing the problem. So I guess we're all here tonight to say help, because even with the police aware of this and coming to the house, it doesn't stop and has now progressed to the point where they are making threats against those of us who are trying to document what is going on in this house. And um, I guess that's, that's about it. We just want our children to be back out riding their bikes and unafraid to be on the street. And we're just here tonight trying to get some input and some help from, from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I know that our captain is here this evening, and I'm sure he'd be happy to speak to you um, out, out in the, he's right over there um, outside. Uh, but we'll move on to a concerned resident or concerned neighbor, uh, number three, followed by four, of course. Good evening. Good evening. Um, a neighbor also. Okay, I've lived in San Marcos for many years, 40 some years. I moved to this home 24 years ago, and I'm the one that has the licensed family child care. Before, it was so nice with all my kids. We used to do our monthly walks around the neighborhood. We do fire drills once a month, and we go out to our front yard and perform those. And now I'm limited just to my backyard. I don't think that's fair. I mean, I fear for my kids. We do keep them safe, that we have a large backyard, it's fenced, but it's like, it's not fair for the other young families. I've lived there many years, so my kids are all grown up and moved away. But um, the pedophile, as soon as, you know, I found out he lived there, I was on the phone for two days straight with the sheriff and no one could help me. Um, I know laws have changed and all, but um, I finally got to talk to that person's uh, probation officer. And he kind of, you know, like calmed me down and um, would call me to check on. My concern now is with all this drugs and all, if he was being a model citizen, you know, I really doubt it now. If you guys really knew what was going on in that home. So just calling out for some help from anyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, our, like I, I mentioned, our captain is here this evening. Um, concerned resident number four, followed by number five. And then number six. Hello, Mayor Jones, council members, staff. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to my neighbor's concerns. Uh, my wife and I have been in that, uh, we bought our house there about 15, coming up on 15 years. And <clears throat> realistically, this really came to a point about a year and a bit ago when, as we're getting ready to get out the door, my five-year-old daughter is like, hey, time to go, get into the car so we can take you to school. And she goes out, comes running back inside, hey, dad, there's a dead guy on the sidewalk. As a father, that's never anything I want to hear, where this thing that I kind of push aside, eh, you know what, they'll, they'll stop eventually or nothing, to, without any action on our part, it'll be resolved, and it hasn't been. So we've been pushing towards getting them to a position where we can get this, this nuisance from the neighborhood to have uh, some more respect for the law and be allowed to have our kids be able to be able to play outside and not worry about whether it's the, um, the pedophile, whether it's the drug dealers, whether it's the drug buyers coming into the neighborhood, doing drugs at the you know flop house, whatnot, and then driving away, maybe not completely out of it. Um, and again, it's something that we're asking for your assistance in finding a way to help 
um, you know, the homeowner maybe evict her, you know, her wayward son who is doing all of the dealing and, and stuff. So again, really appreciate your time and consideration. I'm keeping it short uh, so we can get to the next guys, but uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, concerned neighbor number five. Thank you for your time. I've lived in the neighborhood for over 25 years. My kids walk to Richland, Woodland, Mission Hills. Now I wouldn't let them walk anywhere because of the neighbors. There's been more police activity in the last two to three years than in the 25 years I've lived there. I've known the, neighbor, the owner of the house for ever. It used to be the nicest house in the neighborhood and she mentioned it every time we saw her. Um, she came to all of us requesting help. The son and the girlfriend had moved out. They were living in the garage. She requested help from all of us to help her clean out the garage and get her car to be able to park back in the garage. That's what she really wanted. We were cleaning out the garage and there were so many vermin it was just, we were in there with gloves and masks because of the, the smell, the urine, the feces of the, of the vermin. It, if there's any way that we can get some help for her, some social work help to get everything cleaned up and stuff and get them some help. They deserve the help also to get off the drugs. But she needs more of the help to stand up to them. And that's why we're here. And also for our kids and our grandkids to be able to go outside and go play. And now there's, they really can't. That's all we're asking, just for some help for all of us, everyone involved, especially her, just some, a little bit of social help. Thank you very much for your time, I appreciate it. So I, I wanted to mention uh, one safe place here in San Marcos, it's right in the back of the Ashley building. You can walk in and they will help with elder abuse cases, which that seems like this might be what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can go there. They're open. Um, if you go on the website, it's uh, onesafeplace.com. Okay. Uh, you will be able to find out what their hours are. They're open five days a week. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head. Very easy to go in, and they do have all-inclusive uh, situations. If she needs a restraining order, uh, they actually provide those services right there on site as well. Uh, and so everything, it's one of the hidden gems of our city. It's That's just beautiful. been open a couple of years. You might try that to see well, if that might definitely be try helpful. that. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, concerned uh, neighbor number seven. Six. I'm sorry, six. Yes. My apologies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. Thank you for your time today. I'm just going to read a couple quick notes I have here. When we first moved in the neighborhood about two plus years ago, we were very excited. There's lots of families. I found out when we moved in that there were five girls, my girl's age, on the street. So I thought it was great. We have awesome neighbors. It's great. Uh, even before we submitted the offer to buy the house, I drove by and saw a group of dads hanging out in the driveway in one of the neighbor's house. Talked to them, ended up chatting with them about the neighborhood. They said how great it was. That just sold me on the whole neighborhood. Um, as a local realtor, I have a different schedule than most workers. Uh, I'm home a lot more. I spend a lot more time with my daughter, do a lot more after school care with her. Um, and because of the curve on our street, our front door kind of faces both ways. So I'd often look out the street in the afternoon and there'd be kids playing on both sides of the neighborhood. And we'd just jump in and join with spontaneous play dates. Um, I even uh, started a neighborhood band with the street so we could do uh, play at our block party. We have a block party once in a while or local venues in San Marcos. Um, but we're not comfortable doing the block parties anymore because of the drug dealing house and the druggies that come to it. Um, the kids aren't playing on the street anymore because of the drug dealing house and the druggies that come to it. When we have swim lessons at a neighbor's house, we'd have to strategically walk outside of our pathway to 
outside of the way to avoid the house because of the druggy house and the druggies that come to it. Um, I recently taught my daughter how to ride a bike on the sidewalk. What a great memory, right? But I had to go away from the way that I normally do it because of the druggy house and the druggies that live there. I don't want her falling in the bushes and you know <laughs> coming in contact with something like that. Over the past two years, I've seen the level of neighborhood community activity of the families and kids playing outside decreased substantially. But what has increased was the random cars speeding through our street to park at the drug dealing house and the unsavory individuals frequenting the home, as well as sheriff, fire trucks, and ambulances called to the drug dealing house several times a month. Um, I don't know about you, I can't remember the last time I had a first responder called to my house. Um, it should be apparent that with the frequency of these first responder calls, it's a bigger problem than just relying on the reactive calls of the great first responders. They're doing the best that they can, but it's a bigger problem. I heard someone say uh, a night in jail to some of these druggies is a free meal. So whatever's happening is not working. We need help with the next step. Uh, I've, I've even seen a drug deal, drug deal in broad daylight, as everyone else is talking about here. Uh, so please know this activity is not relegated to evenings or nights when kiddos are asleep, everyone's in their house, and the street is quiet. This happens during the day. Because the decisions made by the people in this home, anytime we step out onto our street, or students walking home via our street from Richland, Woodland Park Middle, or Mission Hills High School, which are all within less than a mile away, we are subjecting ourselves to possibly witnessing a drug deal, someone passed out in the front yard, someone passed out on the sidewalk, in front of their house or even getting buzzed overhead by drones, all of which have, have hap happened. Even worse, the potential altercation or outburst directed towards a resident or student walking home from school as the behavior of some people on drugs is unpredictable. Also, if they're driving, we don't, we're, not sure, we're not completely sure that they're sober driving as well. My wife and I work very hard to create a safe and age-appropriate environment to raise our family in. And as you can see, quite a few of my neighbors feel the same way. We ask that you uphold San Marcos's mission statement to improve the quality of life of those who live, work, or visit San Marcos by providing a safe family atmosphere that is rich and diverse in culture and natural resources and promotes economic educational opportunities. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Um, concerned neighbor number seven. Good evening, city council members. Um, I also might be able to speak to that final slide that um, concerned citizen number one was uh, going to speak to. Um, as a San Diego native and a proud San Marcos resident, I am here alongside all of my neighbors to express my deep and overwhelming concern about the safety and well being of our neighborhood, particularly its impact on our children and our families. In 2021, our family grew uh, as we welcomed our son, and we moved into our home in San Marcos a year later, nearby where my husband grew up, uh, after finding what seemed to be the ideal neighborhood for us. This was a place where children could play freely and families could thrive together. I met several of the neighbors at the open house, all of whom are here today, and I was really thrilled, um, just like the last person who spoke said, to see how many families with young kids were on our potential street. And so the reality upon moving in was starkly different from our expectations. While we have been very fortunate to form close bonds with many of our neighbors here, as you have already heard, we've also found ourselves amidst a really disturbing environment rife with drug activities. The past year and a half have been marred by continuous influx of drug deals, verbal altercations, and individuals under the influence loitering on our streets. Witnessing these unsettling scenes on a daily basis and throughout the course of the day and the night, including drug users passing out on lawns, driveways, sidewalks, unleashed aggressive dogs whose owners have passed out, leaving them loose and uncontrolled, has shattered our sense of security. As you've heard from my neighbors, our once vibrant and promising neighborhood has transformed into a shadow of its former self. It's now a place where fear overshadows outdoor playtime and any excursions outside. Because of the proximity of our home to 647, as well as the constant drug beat of drug related, drum beat of drug related activity through the street, we also no longer allow our son to play out front. There's way too much of a risk that he'll access whatever they've stashed in the bushes or around the neighborhood. And if it's knocking grown adults out for 30 plus minutes at a time that I've witnessed with my own eyes, 
I can only imagine what it would do to a child. It's simply not safe, and it is incredibly hard to avoid. In fact, in recent months and weeks, the situation has only escalated, with incidents of both the residents, resident dealers and frequent clients collapsing in plain view, emergency responders becoming a frequent presence, and the threat of harm becoming palpable. I truly considered not presenting publicly today out of the fear for our safety, and yet I decided to stand here today terrified of the potential retaliation because our kids deserve so much more than this. They need to protect, be protected, and we need to be heard. It's honestly hard to describe just how much this has impacted our community and our family, and the images that you saw earlier are honestly just a small glimpse of what we see and deal with. I work from home. I have a direct line of sight into all of the activities every single day. And this is in our face every day, every night. There's no break. It's brazen. It's bold. They have no regard for the law or other people's safety. They, they clearly understand that they don't have any, any consequences, and we're honestly exhausted. Despite the pleas for assistance, the response has been pretty disheartening. We've had a lot of wonderful people try to help us, and we're very grateful for those efforts, so I don't want to discredit that by any means. But each time that we feel that there's movement and there's weight lifted off of our shoulders, we're told that their hands are tied, and we are left, once again, feeling powerless. It feels as if those who are perpetuating the situation, the drug dealers and users, the residents of 647, those who have taken the joy and the safety of our neighborhood away from all of us, the families and law-abiding citizens in our community, that somehow they have more rights than we do. I think one of the things I wanted to touch on on this slide in particular is speaking back to the um, continued police presence and emergency responses that we've been seeing just in this year alone, so January 1st to yesterday, our neighborhood has requested non-emergency and 911 emergency responses six times alone for that house. That's been a, a mix of continuous drug deals, possible overdoses, loitering, and suspicious activity, and most recently, drug buyers attempting to go into the wrong house at midnight, which I was watching, and we called 911 in response to that. The power to affect change lies within your hands, and we really need and would appreciate your support. As my neighbor shared, our hope is to have impactful intervention to restore the safety in our community and to provide our children with the opportunity to reclaim the right to a carefree childhood. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you. Um, so we're limited, I mean, we, you know, unfortunately the laws in, in our state are what they are, um, but we're gonna do everything we can. Our, our sheriff captain is ready to come out into the foyer with you all and, and discuss everything that um, he's going to be able to do. And uh, he wants to do that. We wanna make sure you have a safe neighborhood. I, I have a problem house in my neighborhood too and it's gated, so it's uh, a little bit different, but a lot of us do have issues. Oh, sorry, um, can I? No, it's okay. I just was wondering if it was about this, if I needed to. It's okay. All right, so if you could just um, actually meet him out there. His name is uh, Captain Kevin Ralph, and he is heading over that way. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay, and then for the rest of you that are still here this evening, we have a few speakers that wouldn't like to speak, but they have a, um, a statement that they would like me to read. So I will just say the statement once, and then I will say their name. Uh, so the statement is, I am a resident of Villa Serena. I am here to support myself and my companions. I desire a just and defined process. So that would be Elizabeth Sierra. Uh, Penny Wu, Octavia Carrillo, Antonia Montoya, Irma Raimonde, Irene Carrillo, Marina Ornelius, Salvador Gomez, Elizabeth Santos, Ernesta Flores, Justo Zarate, Anna Li Liliana Cruz, Eduardo Caleros, and Arturo Ramirez, also Simone Rincon. 
Okay, so all those residents, uh, again, I will read their, the statement one more time, and that is, I am a resident of Via Serena. I am here to support myself and my companions, and I desire a just and defined process. Thank you for um, having your voices heard this evening. And that will be the end of our public comment um, for the first communication. So now we will be moving on to new business, item number 11, uh, which I believe we have a short um, presentation by staff or something along those lines. Thank you, Isaac. Yes, thank you, or Madam Mayor. Michelle, um, Isaac Etchmendi, our Development Services Director, is here to present some information on the item that you requested be placed on the agenda that relates to bus-only transit lanes. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Okay, to, uh, before we get started a little bit on bus-only lanes, I wanted to kind of go over a few definitional items. So. Uh, first, bus-only lanes uh, are roadway lanes that serve as dedicated lanes for bus use. This can be done either through 24-7 use or through some kind of managed time period. Uh, the ultimate purpose of these types of lanes is to provide improved access to buses, uh, allowing transit operators to improve frequency and timing of buses. Typically, bus-only lanes also provide buses the ability to bypass congestion on roadways enhancing the ability of the bus to efficiently operate and improve ridership. So within this first slide that you're seeing before you uh, is a center bus lane. What this is is if you can imagine going down the center of the roadway, we have dedicated bus lanes in this depiction. We have them going one each direction. Uh, with the main line of the roadway, that's the, the part we most of us normally drive in our vehicles on either side, and then depending on the configuration of the roadway, you might have parking, bike lanes, et cetera. So in the next slide, what we have is if that bus only lane was on the curb side, uh, these are you know similar to the, the center line ones, but these are adjacent to curbs. Uh, they function very similar to what you see with normal transit. They are also dedicated for bus only, but they might have pedestrian activity directly adjacent to them. With bus only lanes, there are certain potential impacts. For example, with enforcement, if you have a bus only lane, the police or sheriff in this city's case would need to enforce uh, to ensure that there's not mixing of traffic along these uh, restricted lanes. Uh, there's also additional signal complexity, particularly with median bus lanes. Uh, that is because typically the bus lanes are following a fixed route versus the movements of vehicles which are meandering and turning at each intersection. Uh, also, uh, generally, if you're doing these types of lanes and you have a roadway that you have no space to put and then widen, uh, you're going to take these away from general throughput of your roadway, general roadway capacity, and general vehicular traffic. Um, additionally, if you're doing some of these things uh, in the median area, you might choose to take a median away or modify the median substantially in order to ac accommodate that. So those are some of the potential impacts that bus-only lanes have. Uh, the resolution before you today uh, has a couple of items in there regarding a policy on design of bus-only lanes. The bus-only lanes would be uh, only available to be installed uh, if it does not supplant a general purpose lane or a median. Uh, additionally, if the uh, a bus only lane would ev only even be viable if there was sufficient throughput of a roadway in conformance with our planning documents. So for example, San Marcos Boulevard is currently planned to be a six lane arterial, arterial roadway. If you wanted a bus only lane on that roadway to even be considered per this proposed policy, you would need to widen the roadway to accommodate that. Uh, additionally, any project which would propose to install bus only lane would be subject to city council approval per this proposed policy. Uh, with that, that concludes staff's presentation and I am available for any questions you might have. Thank you, Isaac. And and so what, what actually brought this forward was um, in a Caltrans slash Sandag meeting that Tess Sangster and I were in uh, last year there was some discussion because there had been uh, a lot of discussion at the board uh, level at Sandag, and um, and I had I had heard that from Carlsbad through Escondido they were talking about a bus only lane, 
And I was like, well, wait a minute, that would have to go through San Marcos, and so that would mean San Marcos Boulevard. So I started asking about it, and but no Sandag staff would actually answer my question because I said, well, wait a minute, wouldn't you need some sort of authorization from the city? Because right now it's very tight as far as the real estate goes. Uh, you don't have a lot of uh, lanes, and um, you know a lot of the businesses are right up to the road. Uh, in many cases, and so I was like, well, how would that work? And there was a discussion about uh, possibly a median being taken out, and I said, okay, well, we clearly need to do something here in the city. We're not, we're not taking out the median on San Marcos Boulevard. It's one of the beautiful things about our city is we have a lot of trees, uh, fol foliage uh, that, that makes San Marcos so beautiful, and I wouldn't be uh, in favor of something like that. So. Fast forward to at our last meeting at Sandag where we talked about the um, discussion of what the 2025 plan will look like moving forward coming to the city, or I'm sorry, coming to the board of directors at Sandag. Uh, the discussion was no longer having a bus only. You can still have a BRT, which is bus rapid transit, except it would not be uh, using up its own lane, uh, which I was happy to hear, but I, I felt it important to move forward with this, being that it was already in, um, uh, we were ready to start taking action to bring it forward anyway. I said, go ahead and uh, let's complete the process, because for me, um, I think, you know, San Marcos Boulevard already has a lot of traffic. Many of the residents uh, complain about it to me, personally, and I tell them all the time I'm fighting at Sandag to make sure they don't uh, remove any of those uh, lanes. I know it's an issue, uh, but also to make sure that we're not taking away one of the most beautiful parts of our city, and that is our medians, uh, that, you know, they still are pretty. We still appreciate them. I know I do, um, and uh, to make sure that we are not doing that. So that's why this has moved forward. Uh, we do have three public speakers on it, but I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background why I felt this was important for me to bring forward on this and we do um, I might mention too we do have um, a letter that was uh, received today by the entire City Council from people that are outside of our city uh, that don't really appreciate in my opinion um, I, I, I think they do have uh, you know important goals uh, but they they uh, take issue of what we're doing inside of our city. And I, I know many of you that are out there this evening often hear me say, I don't really want people that are outside. I don't want state mandates. I don't want state control. I don't want anyone outside of San Marcos deciding what we do inside of our city. I think that's the residents. And we are, um, the five of us, are your representatives. And so how do we keep San Marcos, San Marcos? It's getting increasingly more difficult all the time, that's for certain. And, um, you know, so anyway, we, we did receive a letter today um, uh, stating that they, um, they want us to oppose what's happening in our city for, um, and that would be Vision Zero, uh, the San Diego County Bike Coalition, Climate Action Campaign, uh, San Diego 350, also another person from San Diego 350, Circulate San Diego, Ride San Diego, and Families for Safe Streets for San Diego. Um, folks outside of our city, I think it's important for us as a council to um, uh, move forward on, again, you know, trying to keep San Marcos, San Marcos. Um, I don't have an issue with the BRT, bus rapid transit, coming through our city. I do, I am opposed to taking away lanes that folks already need uh, to be on. Uh, when we have limited real estate, and I certainly am not in favor, as I mentioned earlier, of removing any of our medians because, again, I think that's one of the really pretty things about our city. I don't uh, want us to become like San Diego, where many of these folks are from, uh, where they don't have medians in their uh, cities, where they have just a lot of asphalt, and I, I, I I'm opposed to people um, trying to tell us how to run our city. I think our residents um, expect us to protect them, protect our way of life. And with that, um, we, we can have council discussion after. I just wanted to provide some backstory. Uh, we have three speakers on this. Uh, that would be Marlene Walder, followed by John Mosier. And then we, our third speaker is uh, Paul Mendoza. So uh, Marlene, come on down.
Madam Mayor, City Council audience. Anyway, my re reply to this is, as much as I would hate to see a bus lane, as you say, you have allowed, not you, but the state has allowed us to put in housing without uh, enough parking for two-car families who are now three, four, and five-car families. We see it in our mobile home park, even though supposedly we don't have children. Um, if you don't make the buses run faster, just like the Sprinter, I took the Sprinter to work for two years, but to go to work, it was 15 minutes by car and 45 minutes to get there by the Sprinter. Coming home, it wasn't as bad because traffic was heavy already then, but it was 15 minutes to come home. I mean, 30 minutes and the Sprinter was 45 because I'd have to drive to the Sprinter location and then get on the Sprinter and wait, you know, be on time, not miss it. The same thing now today because traffic is so heavy, it takes 30 minutes to get to the job where I used to work, but it would take an hour to get home where the Sprinter would only take 40 minutes because they get to have the lights in their favor. If we don't make buses as uh, um, easy to use with the traffic, and when I lived in Switzerland for a while, they had the buses down the medium, and they really did. And they, the biggest thing was if you're handicapped, but they, um, would pick you up in that medium, you'd have to get across, and sometimes if it would be in San Marcos Boulevard, I would uh, be more worried about my life trying to get across because there, there weren't that many cars. Buses were the norm. To go wherever we went, we could catch a bus constantly. Every 10 minutes there would be a bus and you'd have to know which one you're taking but it would be such a pleasure. If you want people to take the buses instead of mass transit or use the bus lane as a carpool lane also, then, um, and it would have to have three or more people in the car, I guess, but that would be the only way to get people out of their cars is if it would be more often and more current um, travel and it may mean more buses, but smaller ones. Like the Sprinter I see is almost always empty. And when I used to go for work, there would only be about 12 of us on the sp each car. You know, there were two cars with the Sprinter. It was because it wasn't really convenient. I had to still walk almost a mile or a half a mile to get to my job but it was still better than taking a car because we had no parking and there were 200 employees with 23 parking spaces. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Marlene. And um, just for clarification, a BRT, bus rapid transit, doesn't generally stop very often, so it wouldn't be stopping on San Marcos Boulevard. It's from Carlsbad to Escondido, so it probably wouldn't even stop at all. Um, just oh. so you're aware, yes, it's it's a transportation from one point to another. Bus rapid transit, it's not a regular bus, so it doesn't stop very often, if at all. It wouldn't so make it's a, a point, stop in San Marcos? Most likely not, so just to give you a little background oh. on that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, next speaker is John Mosier, followed by Paul Mendoza. Hi, Mayor, City Council. Um, when I looked at this, I, I look at it as a smaller view of how we move our residents around our city. Um, the shuttle buses that I see from North County Transit District are a good size with the, the North City going in, uh, the Farmer's Market, um, the developments that you're approving 
uh, to replace like Restaurant Row, um, the one where I used to work at uh, Star Builder Supply, what's going in on Grand, where uh, Chamber of Commerce used to be, getting people to that. Um, my thing is how we get a people around for that. Um, and being on Barham Drive, uh, close to Escondido by La Marae, we have another development now. They've started breaking ground next to, between Grace Church and us. So before long, that thing will be up. Um, Barham gets overloaded very easily most of the day. Um, it, it needs help in many different ways. Even from Grace Church back this direction, um, you've only got a couple lanes. Now, I'm not sure what your layout is on that, and I know they've got some drainage. But to get around the city and give our seniors who, as they get older, can't really drive anymore or shouldn't, be able to have access to all these amenities that, that are being put in, it would be nice to have something out there to help help them get around between the shuttles and or when I hear the bus only lanes, I, I think of more a design flow to get our people to places. When I've been to the senior center, I, I've seen a couple of our people from our park having, having lunch there. They have great lunches at a very good price, but others that could, would be able to take advantage of it can't get there. Uh, the question is how we facilitate that. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm looking at maybe as we build out to the future that we allow some room to have these shuttles run more, more frequently or on specific days to go to our parks, go to our mobile home people and our seniors and help them get around um, a greener city. Thank you. I agree with you, John, and that's a different discussion. And right. actually, Deputy Mayor Jenkins and our city manager and I were having this discussion this afternoon. She will have an update um, in her North County Transit uh, discussion. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Mendoza. <clears throat> thank you, City Council. Um, so I'm here to express my opposition to uh, this resolution. Um, as we continue to embrace dense housing developments, it becomes imperative to parallelly densify our transportation infrastructure to accommodate the increased population and their mobility needs effectively. In urban planning, it's widely recognized that car traffic swells to occupy all available road capacity, a concept known as induced demand. This underscores the reality that merely adding or widening roads without curbing demand inadvertently encourages more people to drive, thus failing to alleviate traffic congestion. In the absence of deterrence, such as demand-based road pricing, there is minimal incentive for individuals to forego unnecessary journeys, leading to increased traffic, particularly during busy periods. This congestion effectively serves as an inherent tax on commuters penalizing them with longer travel times and increased stress, demonstrating that unchecked car usage comes with significant societal costs. In our city, specific thoroughfares, such as San Marcos Boulevard and Rancho Santa Fe Avenue are prime examples of this issue, particularly during school pickup times. San Marcos Boulevard has a D and C level of service depending on the section. The congestion on these roads not only impacts our commute times, but also affects the efficiency of our public transportation and emergency vehicles as buses and ambulances and fire trucks are caught in the same traffic as personal, personal vehicles. Enhancing our roads with dedicated bus lanes on these key routes may significantly improve transit reliability, public safety, and, of, and attractiveness of alternative transportation methods. Additionally, uh, the introduction of bus rapid transit between San Marcos and its neighboring cities promises to revolutionize public transportation in this area, offering a more efficient and reliable alternative to conventional bus services. Additionally, our own, the buses that run currently for NCTD could use these bus lanes if we had a bus going up and down San Marcos Boulevard. In conclusion, I'm open to various solutions to improve traffic along these roads, including possibly dedicated protected bike lanes rather than just dedicated bus lanes. The key is not to dismiss, dismiss any potential strategies prematurely. We should empower our city planners, regional planners, and industry experts to propose a range of solutions. This way we can thoroughly assess each option based on its merits and practicality for our growing city. I would just like to also add, um, 
there is currently no bus route that goes down San Marcos Boulevard. There's bus routes that go along San Marcos Boulevard in sections, but if you want to get from uh, like from here to Carlsbad, there's no bus route that just takes you from here to Carlsbad. And there's a lot of homes that all live within the walk shed of San Marcos Boulevard that could, the people on those, in those homes, apartments, um, condos, could get on the bus and take it all the way to Carlsbad. But we don't have, um, we don't currently have a bus lane that goes, or a bus that goes down San Marcos Boulevard. Um, and then uh, I believe that it said, I believe, Isaac, you said San Marcos Boulevard is a, is a six lane road. Is that in just sections or are you saying that's the general plan? That's the current general plan. So the current general plan allows for San Marcos Boulevard to be six lanes. It also is intended to be a multimodal corridor, which means it gives a variety of different modes uh, that will use it, including bikes, buses, et cetera. Okay, and then also in the picture that you showed where well, lane was being taken for the bus, there was also a lane for cars that were all lined up. Uh, I don't think having along a high value piece of property like San Marcos Boulevard dedicating a lane like that to just cars being parked is an effective use of transportation infrastructure. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. Um, okay, uh, discussion with the council, among the council. Public comment, I guess, would be close then. Yeah, thank you. I would, I would like to hear from the deputy mayor about the routes for North County Transit. I, I see buses on San Marcos Boulevard all the time, <clears throat> and I know that uh, they plan their routes based on demand. So, I, I don't have any of that information with me yeah, right now. But I, I, I made a note, and I'll find out about it. I, but well, could, sure. let, let me interject for one second because I was on North County Transit for six years, and then I was chair for two years. Um, it goes through a pretty in-depth process of adding a, a route and eliminating a route. It doesn't just happen overnight, and it's and it, it it is it is based on demand, and also it's about the impact on the community of whether you can add or whether you can actually get rid of um, a a um, route. There are um, times where there are um, like a like a, an introductory sort of short-term sort of uh, route that, that can happen, but it, it really goes through a lot of, um, it, it's actually, there's a law that has to be followed. I forget what it's called. Is it like dis, disparate impact or something? I, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's pretty in-depth. So it's not just easily you add one, easily you take one away. It's, it's pretty in-depth. But anyway, uh, Council Member Musgrove, maybe you wanna just c continue with your comments? You addressed my comments. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, anybody else? Yes, Deputy Mayor. So, a um, couple comments that I thought of um, here. Um, and, Helen, I have a question for you. So, if this resolution is adopted, um, if there are changes that happen at the mm -hmm. state level that affect what we have approved um, or not approved, <laughs> Um, how does, how would that impact this resolution? Um, I'll give you the universally unsatisfying response, which is it depends. Okay. It depends on the scope and extent of whatever the state may do or the regional agency may do. Uh, as the city experienced and all charter cities experienced with SB7, um, when the state was stymied about making um, charter cities pay prevailing wage on their projects, uh, they turned around and said, uh, after SB 7, uh, that you don't get any state money unless you play the game our way and you pay prevailing wage. Uh, that is likely something that would happen. This is a policy. It's an uncodified expression of local policy and objectives. So in, in terms of the strength of this versus the strength of a state or regional action that ties money to taking their conditions and requirements, I don't really lay odds on the local policy, frankly. Right. But it depends. It depends on the scope and extent of what action is taken by the state or the regional planning agency. Okay, thanks. That's what I thought you were gonna say, but I just wanted to clarify. Um, so one of the things we hear about all the time is traffic. Um, 
And in my mind, yes, I agree it'd be great if more people rode transit. Right now is the way it is, they don't. There are plans in place to increase um, bus ridership, to increase um, times and all of that. It's not going to happen right away. My, in my mind right now, if Sand Day came down on us as the street, as the road stands right now and took a lane away from us, I cannot imagine all of those cars going down one lane. Um, so um, the other thing is talking about the general plan update that um, Isaac mentioned um, and the six lane possibility there. Um, in my mind, that's, that complete street's gonna have to be completely reviewed as part of the, um, what's that part of the general plan where we talk mobility. about? Mobility, thank you. Um, because that may not be realistic as we get to that point in the future. So as of right now, um, I think the mayor is right when she made the comment that um, um, we don't like people outside of San Marcos telling us how we should um, make our decisions and do things because I think to give up a lane as it sits right now with the configuration would be a huge mistake for our residents. So um, um, I am supportive of this. I think it'll change in the future. It, it could, and, yes. this, and this is a policy. Remember, it's a policy. Right. And if you if you look at, for instance, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the amount of real estate that we currently have. Many of the businesses are really close yes. to San Marcos Boulevard. What are we going to do? Are we going to start um, allowing businesses to be impacted by um, a BRT coming down the middle when it doesn't have to be a dedicated lane? It could still run on San Marcos Boulevard, it doesn't necessarily have to take any of our real estate. Again, back to the point of local control is is definitely the best way, in my opinion. I have I object all the time when the state uh, passes things. Um, they don't know. I mean, they're always passing policies that affect our community substantially. I mean, I, I just I I think that. All of you out there have people that you can elect in office or you don't have to elect us, but we're here to represent and fight for your, um, for your uh, interests. And part of that has to be that we will retain local control. And you know, having a BRT, like I said, I have no problem having a BRT. I mean, when I, I actually talked to Sandag staff last week, I was like, great, I think this is wonderful. It doesn't have to be a dedicated lane, but we have to ensure as your elected leaders that we are going to at least bring this forward and have um, opportunities where we are protecting your, um, your best interests. So uh, with that, um, any further discussion? Did you have anything? Yes, council member. Thank you, Mayor. I do, I do have some um, questions for, for Isaac. Um, I think, I'm certainly not in favor of uh, limiting our possibilities, our options, and especially because I think transportation and the issues that we hear about the traffic and the, all the changes that are happening in our city and really substantial changes. I am in favor of keeping our possibilities open and considering that especially that area, if it is, if it was to, to happen in San Marcos Boulevard, um, I think the anticipation is that that area is gonna be transformed. And so I'm not sure uh, by adopting this today, it's not clear to me what that does to, to this governing body. Um, so having said that, and I think it's a follow-up to the vice mayor's question about the changes in, in state law, but specifically, Isaac, what's not clear to me, so if we adopt this policy today and Sandag was to tell us that they're gonna take over San Marcos Boulevard in the dedicated lane, what does our process look like? What does that evaluation look like? So they couldn't come in and own the roadway. We would still retain control over the roadway. 
Uh, the typical process for if, say, Sandag wanted to do a project, or even North County Transit wanted to do a project on city roadways, they would come in similar to a developer. They would submit their plans. We would review them. Our current ordinances already govern that we would go through the permitting process. Uh, pursuant to this proposed resolution, it does require that anything that is proposed like that would have to come before you. So ultimately, you would have to decide on that if it did come forward. Uh, in my discussions with Sandag in the past, they have conveyed that they would be open to investigating these types of things like BRT, you know, in line with what our design policies are. Uh, so we would just look at that and that would go through the permitting and approval process. Typically, if you were doing improvements and it was in line with our planning documents, ultimately that would be an administrative approval. Uh, but in this case, because you're establishing a design policy and criteria for that, we would evaluate it in line with that. So I do have a, a follow up to that. Um, do we have other policies that force the city staff to bring that to council as of now? We do not on roadways, however, they're quite common within you know, our land use elements. We have elements like that. Um, I'm not aware of any off the top of my head um, that would require as far as roadway improvements. However, we don't currently have any design criteria around bus only lanes. Okay, thank you for that. I don't have any other questions. Okay, I did wanna make uh, one comment. So at North County Transit District, I'm gonna see if I can just go over all of these. So it would be the elected leaders from Escondido, Oceanside, the County of San Diego, Vista, Carlsbad, Del Mar, Solana Beach, Encinitas, and San Marcos that would make a decision on whether uh, they bring forward a bus only at North County Transit. And then if it's done by SANDAG, then it's all of the 18 cities in the county plus the county, so that's 19 agencies that are voting members. Again, you know, I'm going to go back to, this isn't a state law, this isn't, we're not talking about that. We're talking about other elected officials from other cities having um, a say in what happens in our city, which I think that is a real problem. I certainly don't think that if San Diego said to me, hey, listen, um, you know, we don't really want a BRT in our city. I wouldn't vote for it, but that's me. I know what I do. I know how I operate. I don't begin to tell anyone in Escondido what they should have in their city because I don't feel that's my, that's my purview. I think that, you know, when we adopt policies uh, countywide, I certainly, um, you know, I, I, I certainly try to give the most leeway for any elected official uh, that's representing their city to keep their city the way that they like their city. I don't, I don't think that, I, I think one of the things, people love living in our city. I think it's because we have a, a way of doing business, but it's not like that in every other city. So for me, um, and then, you know, there was some discussion about um, charging to drive on uh, lanes in our city, which I am vehemently opposed because honestly, our low income uh, residents would be hurt the most by that sort of a policy. I, I absolutely do not believe that um, we should do anything. I mean, gosh, people are having a hard time putting food on their table and I, I wouldn't want to affect their lives any more in a negative way. I think it's really important that we work for our citizens, protect, their, protect them, protect their, um, their investment in our community. A lot of people have lived, and we heard from a lot of residents this evening even, that have lived here for, for decades. And so for me, I think we need to do everything we can to protect our community, to keep it the way that it is. A lot of people really do love living here. I think that has to do a lot of different things or different reasons, but one of it is, you know, I don't, I don't wanna lose our medians. I think that doesn't make any sense, but I also wanna make sure that people can move freely as much as possible. Having a BRT without an actual uh, dedicated lane because there is no uh, real estate for it. And I, I don't care if it's today or 10 years from now, I, 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 I vehemently am opposed to um, allowing any elected officials from any other city have control over what happens in San Marcos. So that's where I stand. So I would make a motion to approve. And yes, you can, you can still speak. Thank you. Do you is that it? Okay, go, go right ahead. 
Yeah, well, thanks, Mayor. I appreciate it. And I, I know, wasn't not going to call on him, okay. by the way. I know I'm kind of small and quiet over here in the corner, but um, you're not at all. <laughs> Um, I'm in agreement with you, and I, 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 for me, this is actually uh, very much a local control uh, issue than anything else. Um, it sounds like what what kind of you know prompted this and what's driving this is is a specific uh, uh, case that Sandag may be putting a uh, dedicated bus line through San Marcos Boulevard, and I can't even imagine what that would look like. Uh, not only would it impact uh, traffic and uh, businesses on San Marcos Boulevard, but we are, we have a high school on San Marcos Boulevard as well, and I don't know how that would um, endanger our, our high school kids, um, you know, as they go to and from school. Um, but nonetheless, I I think that um, this ordinance perhaps could protect our our community. Policy, it's a policy. Okay, this policy yep. could perhaps perhaps protect um, our community, um, but at least give our community a chance to have a voice. I'm all for mass transit. I'm all for um, finding ways to, to move people around more efficiently in a clean way. Um, but I also want that to be a conversation. I don't want anybody from outside San Marcos coming to us and forcing something on us. I think some of the conversations that we've had tonight about uh, the drug issues and crime is a, a direct result from policies, statewide policies, um, that have removed some of the teeth that law enforcement has to enforce that and, and we're it's a little bit out of our control and now now with transportation uh, we're faced with that threat again and so this policy um, will give us the opportunity to at least evaluate anything that's uh, being proposed on a case-by-case -case basis and uh, and give our uh, residents a chance to weigh in and ultimately the council to weigh in was that a second Second. Okay. A few more comments, Mayor. Yes. You know, not talking about buses, but talking about local control. There's a, a real life issue occurring right now, and it does involve Sandag, and that's with the city of Del Mar and the relocation of the tracks. And Councilmember Terry Gastulant is their representative on Sandag. She and her uh, fellow council members are trying to come up with a solution that protects the city, it's a city of 4,000, but it is a city and the residents care about their community and they don't, do not want to be railroaded, not to be punny or buffaloed into what other people think are good for that city because they have to live with the end result. And this is, uh, there's some parallels to be drawn here where a community has to have some say as to what goes on in their community and you can still come up with a solution that works and promotes the ultimate goal without making arbitrary decisions that go outside of that, that community that has to live with that end result. And so I listen every couple of weeks to Council Member Gasterlin, and sometimes she gets her uh, fellow members from the other coastal communities to agree with her, and sometimes not. But they do talk about it, and I know they are struggling right now with undergrounding railroad lines, moving them away from the coast, and it has to do with the erosion, but then where do you put it? Uh, the need for having the railroad lines. Everything comes into play on these discussions, but ultimately it is Del Mar that sits right in the middle of the argument, and they're trying to have a voice and they're trying to be heard. So I think this kind of goes to that same solution where if there is an absolute need to put a BRT that goes from Carlsbad to Escondido, it will also go through the intersection at Melrose, or rather Business Park, and San Marcos Boulevard slash um, Palmer Airport Road, which is in the city of Vista. So you're talking about a lot of different jurisdictions. And when that BRT gets to where we're sitting today, it then has to negotiate over towards Mission Avenue. And so then how far down are we going to impact to get this to Escondido? It's not just a simple, well, this sounds like a great idea. It needs to be thought through very, very carefully. What will be the end result, and what is the need that you foresee, and are we creating something to fulfill a goal where there may not be a demand? And I, I, I like your comments, Paul, about the, the shuttles, and that is really a better way to go, and yours as well, John. 
a bus going down the middle of San Marcos Boulevard only gets you from one point to another, when really the need is to be able to negotiate the city. So those smaller routes, the smaller buses that will affect that, I think is a better plan and it's a lot more feasible and it can be done right now without tearing up our roadways or our meetings. Thank you. Well, I've only been trying to do that since 2018. <laughs> I've been talking about that. It takes a while. Anyway, um, any further discussion? We do have a motion in a second. Okay. Um, sorry, no. Um, we, we, sorry, we, we. She well, said we, no, Mr. Yeah, Moser, thank sorry, you. Sorry, sorry, we, we've already passed that. We're actually ready to vote. Um, okay, uh, we have a motion, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's? No. Okay, uh, motion passes four to one. Okay, moving on to uh, oral communications. If you'd like to fill out a speaker slip, we could have you come back up, Mr. Moser, if you wanted to fill out a speaker slip. Actually, I think we could have you do that later. You could just come up and... If you had something to say, sorry, we just we're not. Oh, no, to it, was, it wasn't a change. All I was going to say was, looking at development, and since I've been involved in some over my time, when when he's talking about a future layout of six lanes on San Marcos Boulevard, where are they picking that up from? How did they plan on getting the width? Are they taking it out of the sidewalks or like you talk towards the businesses? That's what I meant. It would be nice to see what he's talking about, how they would achieve that because that would potentially, potentially impact the medians in the middle as to where that space physically is and what legally land own, the city owns to create that. That's what I was trying to get at. Okay, thank you. Um, we, yeah. Yeah, we, we have, um, we have uh, easements, but we don't actually own the property, so. Right. Yeah, okay, thanks. And in many cases, as I mentioned earlier, that's, there is, um, real estate that's right right up to the street almost. Okay, um, moving on to, oh yeah, so no uh, more oral communications, correct? No, okay. Uh, reports, uh, SANDAG. Uh, so at our last meeting, we actually talked, and I'm gonna go back to that again. Um, we talked a little bit about the 2025 uh, plan that we're um, discussing that will be moving forward that is uh, being worked on as we speak. Uh, that's the framework. Um, we talked about the San Marcos uh, Boulevard uh, BRT, which I had already mentioned that they are no longer saying that it needs to be a dedicated lane uh, because the feedback was not that uh, there needs to be a dedicated lane. And I believe uh, Carlsbad is going to be taking action on that. I know for certain uh, the city of Escondido is going to be bringing forward a, um, a policy as well against a BRT uh, dedicated lane due to the real estate issues, the same as ours. And then also on the 78, some of the feedback that I had brought up numerous times was that I didn't feel that taking lanes away um, from what we have today and converting them to manage lanes or, you know, it could be, uh, like an HOV, I'm sorry, like a carpool lane that is four plus people, or it could be uh, something that would be used for um, a bus only, or um, sometimes drivers wouldn't even be able to drive in it. And anyway, I, I had opposed that. So now that, um, now there's been a lot of discussion on that and that's no longer on the table. So they're not talking about uh, converting a general purpose lane that is there today on the 78. And then oh, one of the things that uh, I have been bringing up for quite a while, I feel like it's a win, is um, right now, I don't know if everyone knows this, but from Riverside to San Diego, it's really congested uh, getting people from Riverside County down to San Diego. There used to be a BRT, bus rapid transit, from Riverside to San Diego County going to the Escondido Transit Center. And I've brought it up numerous times after discussions with Palomar Hospital and then also CSU San Marcos and then Kaiser Permanente folks. And so what uh, there is discussion and they're trying to get it in the plan is, um, and they're, they're working on it, is a BRT from R Southern Riverside to uh, actually San Marcos, not the Escondido Transit Center, 
um, landing at CSU San Marcos, and that that would be um, able to help the folks get to Kaiser Permanente, to uh, CSU San Marcos, and then also Palomar Hospital, which I think would be a huge win because if you look at what's happening right now, again, it used to be an actual route, but it was discontinued. I think it was definitely b uh, before COVID. I don't even remember even hearing about it, but it was funded by Riverside. Um, so now it's uh, there's discussions of having it funded between Riverside and then San Diego County. And I had actually spoke to um, a, uh, a while back, uh, a gentleman that was running for, he still is running actually, I think his elections this year, um, the su county supervisor for Riverside, and he was saying he would be in support of this as well. So hopefully we can definitely get an appetite for Riverside to pitch in some money, for San Diego to pitch in some money so it doesn't fall on any one county um, because it is it can be expensive, but I think it would be uh, very beneficial to our two counties to get, you know, unfortunately where we've pushed people so far um, uh, east and north uh, to Riverside because housing is so expensive and we're not building enough of it. Um, not we as in the city, but I'm just talking about the county. And so again, um, I think it would be very beneficial for our county. So did you have anything to add to that, council member? Actually, I don't think you were at that meeting. Um, okay, um, the next would be League of California Cities, council member Musgrove. We met yesterday and we were introduced to our new League of California Cities president who is the mayor of Fowler, about a half hour south of Fresno. His name is Dan Parra. Uh, some brief introductions and some of the guidelines, or rather goals rather, for the upcoming year. And we had a presentation from Amy Fawcett, who is now working with San Diego State University, and she brought, I think, maybe a half dozen from their School of Public Affairs, and they are trying to get off the ground an elected officials orientation program where they would present regional and local issues of concern for elected officials within San Diego County. Um, it would be designed for those officials who are already in office as opposed to those who are running for office. So uh, some of the comments that we had on sidebar were it would be more advantageous to educate people who were considering running as opposed to those who are already in office. So that'll be something they'll work through. Um, I don't recall anything else of significance, Councilmember Nunez. No, that was about it. It was kind of a short meeting. Okay, and that concludes my report. I agree. How did they come up with after you're elected? Because there are a lot, there are a, there's a total disconnect between what the school district does, what the water district does, what the city does. Um, it, it seems like it would be easier to help folks understand the connection prior to running to office, because there are a lot of, um, you know, and then also the state and how the county and the state have laws that govern us as well. I, I agree with you. I think they should uh, revisit that. I do, um, I do wanna mention, Mayor, it, it, they said that they're in the infant stages, so th this is, they did mention that they've done um, a city manager surveyed. I don't know who they went to for th that survey. Um, and I, it seemed like that was the first one they did. They had one for us, right, that they, that they asked us to complete. And so I mentioned that because it's still taking shape and I don't think they know yet exactly what it was gonna look like. I do the, remember them mentioning that they wanted definitely help train the, the newly electeds. So it's similar in a sense to what the um, league already does but they want to focus on the, obviously the local in our region. Yeah, that, I, I, so if you, could, um, you, if you could lodge my feedback, that would be great because I, I don't think they should do it after the fact. I think getting folks um, educated in the beginning actually would be more helpful. I put that in my comments when I okay. completed the survey. Great, awesome, thanks. Yeah, I mentioned it because I think we should definitely yeah. keep an eye on and help yeah. obviously shape it if it does come to fruition. Um, council member, one of the things that I was surprised nobody asked where the funding's coming from for this new program. Did you happen to ask any of the, the San Diego State team? I don't know where they get their money, but they seem <laughs> to have plenty of it. I, well, did, I did ask um, the assistant city manager, uh, Dave, 
who was also presenting, he said they're not sure exactly what the funding is going to look like, but they thought somewhere between two hundred fifty to five hundred dollars for the program, depending on how it all plays out and what it shapes up to be. I just thought they were going to rely on uh, on all volunteers. <laughs> It's better if people are getting paid because then they actually seem to be more engaged, right? I don't know. Um, okay, uh, North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor. Okay, so I, You're have, on. Some, I have some good news. Um, at this Thursday's board meeting, we will receive, and it's an update, okay? Um, we're not voting on it, but it is an update. Um, to, we've been talking about the micro transit pilot program. There's 14 communities involved in it. San Marcos has been selected to be the first pilot. A um, couple points, I'll talk about it more next time, but a couple points to make. It is not a shuttle program. I just want everybody to be clear on that. It is a micro transit program um, with flexible fleets, a few on items demand, right? on, on demand, demand. Mm -hmm. and you pay $5 yeah. a ride. Um, so a couple items about it, um, um, it's not the entire city. They are going to establish a zone within the city based on transit connectivity, efficiency, points of interest, and equity. And based on that, um, they have created um, these zones within, well, for right now, San Marcos. So if you want to research the information, it is online on um, our Thursday agenda, and there is a microtransit pilot program suitability analysis document that you can go online and read. Um, a couple points, um, the typical wait time would be less than 20 minutes. Um, all trips must start and end within this designated zone, which for San Marcos right now is 6.2 square miles. Um, the analysis they worked off of was the national best practices from the um, American Public Transportation Association, um, also called APTA. Um, the, as long as the funding is there, as we establish our fiscal year 24-25 budget, then it would, um, um, be planned to start, it would plan to start in June of 24, and the pilot would last 12 months. Um, and then each year thereafter, they would launch two other pilots, um, within other jurisdictions. Um, and it's all going to be subject on budget um, and then vehicle and operator funding. Um, let's see. A couple other things. It is more expensive to North County Transit than the buses. Um, so that all has to be factored in. So I'll have more after Thursday, but you can go online look at all of this information, and then um, it will come to the board later for, um, for approvals. And I did forget to say something. In the 2025 plan for uh, the Sandeg Regional Plan, micro, micro transit is actually one of our focus points because everyone wants mm -hmm. it. We all, uh, we all realize that to get people to move around in the city on your shorter trips, you have to have micro transit. So, um, you know, we've been talking about it for a while. It's, it's, but it's also Sandeg. It's going yes. to be, a, it's a priority. Yeah. So, so maybe there'll yeah. be some money there. Yeah. Just to give you an idea, the net cost, um, well, the first year, it obviously is only part of the year and it's only one pilot. Um, the net cost is about 38,000. Next fiscal year, it's about 700,000. 26, it's about 877, and 27, it's about 510. So North County Transit needs to find partners to come up with that, mm -hmm. with those funds. Um, so, it's, and 
again, you can go to the analysis and get this information, but just to give you an idea, um, the potential trip generators that they think they'll have within the zone will be Palmer College, Cal State, the DMV, Kaiser, the Senior Center, the Civic Center and the Library, True Care, Social Security Administration, San Marcos High School, and North City. So that's how they've come up with this zone within the, within the city. So I'll have more for you next time. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of discussion and probably a lot of communities that are not happy that they weren't the first pilot. So, but well, we are the first pilot, if, if it well, gets approved. This is all just an update. It's only, I've, all, I've only been asking for this since 2018, so I'm glad something's finally happening. Okay, uh, North County Dispatch, Councilmember Nunez. Thank you, Mayor. We'll meet on February the 28th, so we'll, I'll have an update um, during our first March meeting. Okay, Clean Energy Alliance. We meet the 29th, and I will have the update in March as well. City Council Business Visits. She's pointing at you, so I'm imagining it's Council, Council Member, Member Nunez, Nunez and, and Musgrove. We, uh, we both went on a business visit uh, to Bella Gala event, event Hall, which wow. for reference is right at the intersection of Discovery and West San Marcos near the Rock Church. In fact, they probably share a common wall. On San Marcos Boulevard. <laughs> On San Marcos that. Boulevard. So fancy. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, John, Vilma, and Christian, and Christian being their son, they run this operation. They started it in 2017 in Oceanside, and they wanted a newer location. And for a long time, they were commuting between their home in Spring Valley to Oceanside. So when they had events, they would be there till one or two in the morning, then doing cleanup, prep, driving to Spring Valley, coming in the next day. This particular location, I think they're exclusive to Saturdays for their events, but they will host up to 300 people. It is fantastic. We have some photographs, um, and, and quite honestly, it doesn't do it justice. Um, you could drive right by here every day and not know what's inside there, and they have everything. They don't have a kitchen, per se. They have a, a staging area, so they work with caterers, but they have a dance floor. You can see the dance floor right there. It has the illuminated glass panels. Wow. They have laser lights. They have a fantastic sound system. It's, um, it's, it's, I was very impressed. That's the, the DJ station, bottom left. So Christian, the son, he fired it up for us and uh, ran some of the lights. Um, they've got a photo area in the upper right corner of that photograph. And the 60 on there was for John, the patriarch. It was his birthday, so they had a party for him there. So, and you can see where they have the chafing dishes. So whatever catering company comes in, there's a prep kitchen. They can bring the food out right there. You can do either buffet or they'll do table service. They have an entire area dedicated for baked goods. So if it's a wedding or a quinceanera and you want to bring cakes, cookies, cupcakes, whatever, it's all set up for you. Um, and I believe when we were talking with them behind, they looked like they had a margarita machine set up there, not too far from the DA. Well, I didn't see the margarita yeah. machine. And the Instagram wall. They do have a wall. They actually That's have a couple of them inside there. Uh, wow. Tess and I were fairly impressed, I would say. Um, very yeah. nice people. He, um, he's from Puerto Rico. She's from Honduras. Christian was born here. They have two daughters. One is getting her uh, certification as an esthetician, and the other one is at the medical school at UCSD. Very accomplished family, very focused on San Marcos. They love it here. They are currently renting in District 3, just south of the university, but are actively looking for a home. I was town. just getting ready to mm -hmm. ask if they moved from Spring Valley. Yes. They did. They're <coughs> living in San Marcos. Just the nicest people, mm -hmm. and they are just so completely dedicated. And um, it's just fantastic. You have to go in there and just take it in. No, and in fact, I would encourage um, if you drive by, you'd never know it's yeah. there. It's it's right next to the Rock Church, and um, it seemed like they had walk-in hours, right? People. I asked if they were there, open. Uh, the, the yesterday afternoon was it yesterday afternoon? Yes, it had to be. It wasn't on Sunday. Uh, they opened it up just for us, oh. but uh, they do well enough that they make it almost ex exclusively on Saturdays. And I think they would make an adjustment if it was a special occasion. But they're booked solid, so it's not something you can just call up on Friday and say, "Can I bring people over?" 
but they have a pricing menu based on the number of uh, anticipated attendees, 100, 150, 200, 250, up to 300. And then they make the adjustments with the seating so that it, uh, it accommodates that group. They have areas set up where there's a photo booth and then there are the real nice high back chairs. So if, uh, if there's somebody special that is being received, there's a, an area for them to sit so they can you know, greet uh, the people that are coming in there to congratulate them. They, they thought of everything. They, Cha really they have, have a changing room in there too. So um, like on a quinceanera where you have the girls come in and they need to change their outfits, there's a room dedicated for that with a dedicated bathroom right next door, a little makeup area in addition to other restrooms that are further down on the other side of the room. They, they have thought of everything. It's they really, really nice. They really have. They said they, they take care of all the details. Their, um, their prep kitchen is larger than a lot of business kitchens, but it's dedicated just for the caterers to come in, set up, and then get the food out. Yeah, it really is a beautiful venue. They have a lot of caterers in San Marcos, too. So. They use it. Yeah, great. Okay, anything else? Okay, San Marcos Creek Project. I know. All right, not much to report out today. Uh, rains delayed construction over the prior week, of course, but this week we're continuing to work on the park and working on the landscaping of the roadway as well as putting finishing details uh, like restoring the lighting at the entrance of the mobile home park. So finishing touches. I saw that they were pouring concrete this morning at the Ralph's Shopping Center on that corner. I'm assuming that's somehow connected to all of that because part of the road work is right there at Twin Oaks and Barham, right? And Discovery? Okay, you don't have to answer me, but I, I, I saw a lot of concrete going on. It's actually not the road, it's, it's the sidewalk improvements, but I think it all kind of goes along together, yeah. Mayor. The finishing touches, yes. I just, we don't often hear a lot of positive feedback, so I did want to just share for staff and, and Michelle that this morning when I was at the Chamber of Commerce event, I did have a couple of local business owners uh, come up and, and thank me, even though it was really you, um, for opening up via Veracruz Bridge and that they're very impressed with how it's coming along. Is it flood? No. No, it, it worked no as it was supposed to and uh, the water was flowing in the channel but it, it didn't flood, so Isaac did his job. <laughs> we fared much better than San Diego. There was a lot of flooding in San Diego, unfortunately. Uh, okay, any other uh, council commentary? Happy Valentine's Day tomorrow. Okay, all right, with that, this meeting's adjourned. Mm -hmm.